May 6th, it's a Monday. Welcome to the show, Let There Be Talk. It is episode 749 today. Great guest. Comedian today. Rare that I have comedians on, but when I do, like I've said before, it's somebody that I really respect and appreciate. And today is Tom Rhodes, that man, 40 years in the comedy game. Guy started when he was 17 years old. He was the first guy to have a Comedy Central special. A lot of stories here. A lot. Can you imagine doing comedy for 40 years? I've been doing it for 14 and a half, and I got a million stories. Tom sat down with me here over at the house, and we dug into it, and uh, I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Go see this man live as he tours around the world. He is an international tour. United States, Europe, all over. He's been to China. He's done comedy everywhere, people. And he's a great man. Before I do get into the episode, I want to thank some brand new Patreoners. I have a Patreon, people, and it really helps the podcast. Believe me. I do all of this myself. It's a lot of work and 99% of it is for free to bring you this great show each week. I'm tooting my own horn. Great show. Michael Peters, thank you for joining the uh, Patreon. Logan Rodifer, Skylar Fortune, some uh, new Patreoners. Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. I have... uh, What do I have? Like over 150 bonus episodes, I believe, on there. Let's see here. Let me just check. I dropped one a couple days ago. I believe it's like 150. Yep, here it is. It is 156 bonus episodes. Damn, that is a lot. Anyway, Patreon. Also, this Friday, I will be headlining two shows in San Diego at the Mic Drop Comedy Club, deandelray.com, for all of your tour dates that you need. deandelray.com, San Diego this week, Friday night. And then uh, I'm out there in Denver with Bill Burr, June 5th and 6th at the Belco Arena. June 8th, I'll be at the Greek Theater in Berkeley. And then June 19, 20, 21, 22, San Jose Civic with the great Bill Burr. And then I will be doing a bunch of shows in Vegas. I'm doing a residency there July 8th. I'll be there for seven days, Comedy Cellar at the Rio. And then Acme in Minneapolis, July 24, 5, 6, 7. Those are some great dates. And I really hope to see you out there. That's why... I uh, constantly promote this stuff. I don't want to be fucking annoying, but I I want you guys to know about it. Uh, If you are a Patreon, I'm just going to give you a heads up. I will be talking about all kinds of stuff on the new bonus episode today that will be up at uh, Patreon. I'll be talking about the Hollywood Bowl over the weekend, which I am still fucking floating uh, in the heavens from working with Bill Burr at the Hollywood Bowl, man. Fuck. I can't, even, I can't even process it yet. It was so electric. So I'll be talking about that. I'll be talking about the uh, legendary Sam Ash music stores all closing. Totally sad. America is fucking falling apart. And uh, before you say, yeah, yeah you little libertards, it's fucking all kinds of shit, you dummies. It's, uh, you know... The, the fucking shit is, the shit is crazy right now. It's mostly the internet. When it comes to shopping, everybody shops on the internet. So I don't want to hear your, you get what you vote for. Nah, this shit's been happening over the last 15 years. A little thing called Amazon. Anyway, I'll be talking about Sam Ash. I will be talking about... Uh, a bunch, of, a bunch of fun stuff. A little celebration of Ronnie Wood. I'll be digging in with him. And uh, the Civil War film. I saw Civil War a few days ago. Lots of stuff. So anyway, let's get back into it here, though. Huh, Dean, get to the fucking guest. 
You're always just babbling up at the front of the show. If I wanted to hear that shit, I'd fucking turn on the local radio station. They play three songs an hour, and then they talk the rest of the fucking time. Get to the guest. <laughs> Get to the guest, eh? Ah, see? Get to the guest, motherfucker. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Tom, once again for doing the show. It's a celebration of stand-up comedy today on this episode. And goddamn, do I love stand-up comedy more than ever. Here he is, Tom Rhodes. All right, here we are, another episode of Let There Be Talk. We have a comedian on the show today. That's a, a rare guest. I should probably have more comedians on, I, you know, but... Uh, when I do have one on, it's somebody that I respect and love, and today is Mr. Tom Rhodes here. How are you? 40, Dean Dilbray. 40 years in the fucking game. Yeah, man. I'm 57. I started when I was 17. That's. I had a fake ID when I started, so my career started as a criminal act. That's crazy, dude. 40 years, and you started in Florida? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now my family's originally from Washington, D.C. My uncle did open mic night comedy in D.C. for one year, uh, 1978, I was 11. My dad took me to see him, and the stage was next to the entrance of the club, and I was wearing a Washington Redskins jacket. And the show was in progress when we walked in the door, and the comedian on stage pulled me on stage, and he interviewed me like I was the coach of the Redskins. Wow. And that moment changed my life forever. From that, you know, I'll never forget standing on that stage... See, and I, and I was bashful little kid, just gave one word answers, but I'll never forget all that, you know, room full of people with their heads thrown back in laughter, and D.C. is a really multi-ethnic, uh, multinational city, so there was like all flavors of humanity, and I just thought, you know, when you're a comedian standing on stage, you're talking to the world. Yeah. You know, and my, my dad loved comedy, too. My dad loved Richard Pryor was his dude. Of I remember. course. Driving around even before that with my dad listening to Pryor. So, yeah. Um, so, from the time I was 11, I never wanted to do anything but stand up comedy. Well, that was the thing. Um, what but, year was that? When I started? Well, no, but like, you know, yeah, when you stepped on stage. That, uh, that was 1978. 78. So, then I became a student of comedy. I watched Saturday Night Live yeah, and all the yeah. HBO specials and anything I could get my hands on. Yeah, that was me. You know, it was like the dad, my buddies, the Eric Gibbs, Rex Gibbs, their stepdad had the the records. Cheech and Chong. Yeah. Uh, Richard Pryor, yeah. George Carlin. Um, my dad had Pryor, and my dad loved Bob Newhart. Oh, I love Bob so, Newhart. Uh, I, I grew talk up about him all the time. To, I grew up listening to those Newhart records. Love it. And the show was great. Jonathan Winters back then. You know, all those guys you would see on uh, Johnny Carson that were just mind-boggling. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I used to get the, the, the TV guide. Yeah. And I would look through it at the beginning, and I would, like, circle, highlight the, sh the shows that would have comedians, like, nights. I mean, I watched Carson religiously, but then when, like, he, whenever there was a comedian on Carson or Letterman or anything, I would be sitting in front of the TV watching it. You know? Absolutely. I, I remember when I started comedy, I met Dom Irera. And I remember his set on uh, Johnny Carson wearing the white blazer, you know, kind of the Miami Vice kind of look, the blazer. Yeah. And then when I met him, I was like, oh, my God, dude, I, I love that set. I remembered it, you know. And then, of course, SNL from season one all the way till, you know, basically, I guess once those primetime guys are gone, you know. And then I'd pop in with Chris Farley and stuff. But th those SNLs were nuts. When I moved to Florida... I was 12. The, the, I, I just, when I, last time I was in Florida, I saw the guy who, when I, they asked him to show me, I was like seventh grade, and here's the new kid, will you show him around? And he goes, I'll never forget that first day of school, you were wearing a, a, a Oh No Mr. Bill t-shirt. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. when I was like 14 to 16, Rodney Dangerfield was my god. Oh, my god, yeah. Like before Caddy I did, Shack. And I went to see him in concert when I was 15. Yes. And uh, I, I, when my father died, I found it in his stuff, um, this uh, concert shirt from the Rodney Dangerfield show. Yeah. And uh, I remember wearing that to school. 
You yeah. know, I mean, that was like probably three times a week. I was like such a comedy nerd. Mr. Bill is God to me. I have the doll over there. You press its stomach and it goes, oh, no, <laughs> like, leave Spot alone. Oh, no. It's crazy. Those are hilarious. Oh, yeah. It's weird how simple that was, too. It's just like it's basically just two pieces of clay bullying. It's clay bully. Bully clay. <laughs> That's what it is, right? Now they'd be like, oh, that's bullying and animal cruelty. <laughs> you know, you can, yeah, but uh, what, what, what is it on South Park? Uh, Kenny dies every episode, yeah, right? right? So, right. I mean, it's kind of similar. Exactly. You yeah. know. I loved SNL, man. I mean, I was obsessed because to me, that is my life right there. It was rock and roll and comedy because they, you know, Devo was on. The Stones were on. Yeah. Fear was on. All these... All these bands were playing. So you got rock music, because it was hard to see rock bands back then, except for Don Kirshner's and Midnight Special. And, you know, Johnny Carson didn't have a lot of bands. It wasn't really till Letterman when he started having the bands. Yeah. You know? But, you know, to see comedy and rock, that SNL, holy shit, man. Yeah, and I remember when like cable first came to the neighborhood in Florida, and MTV like transformed crazy life. I crazy. remember like there was one part of our housing development in Oviedo, Florida, where I grew up in Mead Manor, because uh, the the cable went street by street as they installed it. Right. And so we would all go over to um, the, this girl Michelle's house and watch. Uh, just we, after school, we were glued to the TV, you know, and, like learning about fashion, watching the. You know, just everything, you know, how they yeah. did their hair. And then early in my career, I started in 84. And That's it, when I graduated. <laughs> from high school? Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. Um, uh, they would do those uh, MTV spring breaks from, yeah, from Shore. Daytona. And so it was cool. We'd drive over there and go see bands for free. And it was all at this big MTV party. And me and my high school buddies would... We lied and we, we said, um, we, we, we pretended we went to university. We all said we, um, we, we chose Tulane. Oh, we, yeah, Tulane. We told them we went to Tulane, but we didn't know where Tulane was. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, all the, everybody was drunk. Nobody cared. But shortly thereafter, um, MTV started doing the half-hour comedy hour. Wow. And when I moved to San Francisco in 90, uh, I think like 91, 92, I got to do the... The MTV Half Hour Comedy Hour from Daytona Spring Break a couple times. And that Man. was where like comedy and rock and roll converged. Well, it's really interesting because I was engulfed in comedy in San Francisco. You know, uh, Bobcat comes and the San Francisco comedy uh, competition was huge. Yep. Tree won. I remember Tree was this big fucking buzz around town. And that, you know, Alex Bennett and the Morning Zoo show. A hummingbird just flew over your shoulder. Yeah. yeah. What, a, what a great place to do a podcast. Yeah, what he'll get that. Hummingbird cameos. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, that's because you got all those feeders. They yeah, I, mean, I got them. 22 hummingbird feeders. I guess <laughs> they can smell it on me. <laughs> but, you know, Sam Fran was really a comedy mecca in the 80s. And it was that first wave of comedy, that boom. And I was around... Every fucking bar had comedy all of a sudden because that's playing music. So they'd be like, oh, yeah, we'll have you on Thursday. Tuesday's comedy night. And then I will never forget it. My buddy was dealing blow uh, in L.A. And he's like, I go to the comedy store every night and I can get rid of this shit. <laughs> yeah. And we went down there and I was in the main room and it, Dice and Kinnison, man. And I remember seeing Dice and I was going... What the fuck? The stuff he was saying, it was crazy and radical. Yeah. And then, you know, and then there, there they were on that fucking Rodney Dangerfield first, you know, HBO new comics thing. Yeah. And that was it. For that me. was like Led Zeppelin when he came out and he's oh, screaming. Crazy, man. Kennison. We have me. deserts in America. We just yeah. don't live in them. Yeah, 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 yeah. How about you move? That first set he did on Letterman. Wow, yep. man. So all of that really, you know, I didn't fuck it. So I didn't know about Tom Rhodes. I knew about the guys. I saw all the guys, man. I would go see comedy. I was a big Seinfeld guy. I saw him a bunch when I was young, you know, because that show, I loved him. I'd yep. go see him. Um, 
you know, I saw Kennison, uh, I saw Dice, I saw all these guys, you know, but I, I was also playing music all the time, so I wasn't going to the Punchline or Cobbs when it was at Fisherman's Wharf. That was one of the best. But Cobbs, or I mean, Punchline next door was with the best rock club, you know. And yeah, Francisco. you know the Metallica guys. Would always, I've yeah. met um, old Wald, uh, old I've Wald met Wald. Lars and um, Kirk and um, James. Uh, I met James in Chicago. That's a funny story, man. I, yeah. I was at uh, Zany's in Chicago, and he came to the show. Yeah, and it was a. Um, but but the but the Metallica guys, Kirk and um, uh, Lars, Jason. I met. They came. They they loved going to the punchline because that Metallica started at that uh, right. at that Old rock Waldorf, club next door. So they had like a lot of um, you know great spiritual energy memories there and stuff. Oh god! But I was at Zany's in Chicago, uh, in, on Wells Street, the one right downtown. And this is maybe ten years ago. Yeah. And there's a guy that looks like James Hatfield. So there was like maybe there, it was a tiny audience. There was maybe. 20, 30 people there. Guy looks like James Hetfield sitting in the front row. You know what? In the United States, there's a lot of men that look like James Hetfield. 100%. Or, Tom, it, it, or it, uh, uh, Burt Kreischer. It's got, yeah. It's kind <laughs> of a, I, I, in it, the airports, I always say, uh, let's count the Burt Kreischers. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, you'll get like 20, 30. Yeah. That's hilarious. So, you know, because I've traveled all over the world and... Um, uh, I've done comedy all over the world. I, uh, you know, I always, when I'm headlining, I always ask, is there anyone here from another country? Because I have a joke or a story right. uh, about just about anywhere in the world. You know, sometimes I'll get stumped on a Kazakhstan or a Lithuania or something, but most countries in the world. And this woman sitting next to this uh, James Hetfield uh, lookalike yeah. um, is from Argentina. Yeah. And my mother's from Argentina. And I get all excited, and I'm like, oh, my God, and my mother's from Argentina, and I have cousins there, and I'm talking to this woman, and I'm doing my little, uh, you know, five, seven-minute hunk of Argentina material. Yeah. My focus was on her. And then after the show, Jim Brewer right. sends me a text and says, uh, hey, James Heffel was at your show tonight, and he loved it. They were on tour, right? and they were like, they, they had a... They had been in like Omaha, Nebraska the night before. They had like two nights off before they had to be in Kansas City or something. And he flew his, his wife is from Argentina. Right. And they flew, just flew up to Chicago to have a couple nights on the town. Wow. Yeah. That's fucking cool. Too bad you didn't so I had get no to talk idea. to him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been great if you just were laying into him like, look at you, you headfield wannabe and shit like that. Well, but I mean, I've done cocaine with Lars Ulrich, but yeah, I, yeah. I think a lot of people have, so it's not that, <laughs> it's not that special. <laughs> yeah, you know, those guys, man, they are the San Francisco heroes, man. Yeah. Fuck, man. I mean, they are truly what I strive for in comedy or in life you know, self-made, and it's all because of the loyalty of the fans. Yeah. It wasn't anybody else that believed in them. They're the typical thing of you build it all, and, and now you're rolling, and then here comes the business. Like, hey, we always liked you, you know? We just uh, we just didn't know how to, to what to do with you yet, but now we know. Let us get some of that money, <laughs> you know? Yeah. When you first start doing comedy... I mean, it's it's the weirdest thing, right? Because I started 14 years ago, and I'm asking Earthquake, what do I do? Because I would go see comedy all the time, and I, I would truly believe that they were making it up on the spot. Yeah. And then after seeing them a few times, I was like, oh, no, this is a, a, like, a, like a hit song. You yeah. know, they're doing it. And then I, I thought, well, when I do comedy, I'm going to do new shit every night, all night. You know, and then you quickly go like, oh, no, you can't do that. That's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you start to write your first five to do like an open mic and shit. Uh, was it easy for you? No, I was terrified. Yeah. Um, you know, because I was in this adult world yeah. and I only had high school experiences. Right. I only had the experiences of a 17 year old. Eddie Murphy style. And um, I was I, I was really terrified. I, uh, uh, I remember looking over the audience's heads because I was so nervous, like the, the first few years. And I would say there's a, 
really powerful transformation happens when a comedian gets confident. Yeah. Because now when I'm on stage, I purposefully look everyone in the eyes. Yep. Because words come out of your mouth more naturally when you're looking in someone's eyes when you speak. And it's why it's what you have to do when you're acting. And in real life, it's powerful. You can tell when someone's like shifty or nervous and in real life when you talk to them and you look them in the eye and their eyes are darting around. And they're looking past you and yeah. shit. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, it's, it's a powerful thing. So my comedy changed, you know, when I got confident and was able to look people in the eyes. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the local scene, you know, I, I think I was kind of like a mascot because I was this, everyone knew I was underage. They liked having me around. And, you know, my heart was really in it. My senior year in high school, I started to do one-nighters around Florida, just making it back. If I had a gig in, like, Miami or Fort Lauderdale, I'd just make it back in time to go to school. That was me. And I'd be drinking music. all night, and yeah. I'd, like, I'd show up smelling like booze and yeah. cigarettes. Like, who's yeah. this fucking guy? Yeah. You know? That was me with music. People would be like, hey, did you watch fucking Laverne and Shirley? I was like, nah. No. I was down on Broadway till yeah. three thirty in the morning. Yeah, I didn't. My senior year, I didn't. I did. I didn't go to you know football games and yeah. th you know I got to host the the pep rallies and talent shows and things like that because right. everyone knew I wanted to be a comedian. But um, I mean, I was I dove into it. And who was big at that time? Well, it's Ken. It's uh, I mean, it's uh, like so eighty four. You were saying? Yeah, and I, I graduated eighty five. So that's. Like that boom of like Caddyshack, uh, of course, you yeah. got Rodney, uh, and you know, Fast Times at Ridgemont High is huge. Oh, so yeah, that was huge when I was in high school. Yeah, those comedies are That's happening. That's my skull. Fuck yeah. Oh, dude. I see those checked, uh, checkers, um, vans, vans everywhere now. Yeah. Those are totally Jeff Spicoli's, and people I love them. It kills me people wear those and don't know that that was the Jeff Spicoli show. I got a pair right now. I just got, <laughs> I get a pair every couple summers. And when you wear just, them out? Just a flying shoe. So I moved to New York City when I was 20. Wow. And I wasn't. What neighborhood? I lived in Washington Heights. Oh, yeah. As crack was coming to the neighborhood. Yes. And where I lived on Cabrini Boulevard, there, there was gunshots at night. And people would steal cars in lower Manhattan and drive them up to uh, Washington Heights and just set them on fire and walk away. It's crazy. So in the morning, there'd be like smoldering, burned out cars. Oh, yeah. That it was a really rough neighborhood. Now, Washington Heights is having this renaissance with um, musicals and... TV well, back shows. then it looked like Vietnam, dude. It was rough back then. It was crazy yeah. when you see some pictures of the eighties. And I, the, so the only club I could play in the city was Dangerfields. I couldn't oh, yeah. couldn't get on at the at the other place. But how are you getting on? Do they have they have you created a name by the time no. you moved to New York? Now uh -uh. you're just there trying um, to get on. Richard Belzer helped me. Oh, wow, he helped me. I'd worked with him in Atlanta at the Punchline. Yeah, and um, he walked me into a few places, but. You know, I was starving. I wasn't making any money. I was doing one-nighters in Long Island and New Jersey. And it was horrible. And uh, I moved back to Florida, licked my wounds for a year. And then when I was 22, I moved to San Francisco. And that's when it's booming. And that's where... And I moved there because I didn't want a sitcom. I didn't want to go to, to L.A. I wanted to just work on being a great stand-up. And I always thought a higher intelligence of comedy came out of San Francisco from watching Letterman and, you know, all those Bobcat and... Yeah. Um, Bobcat yeah. was a killer, dude. He kills right now. Yeah. He, he, got, he doesn't do Bobcat, uh, that character anymore. Yeah. But holy shit, Doesn't man. need to. His storytelling's great. He directs the shit out of some of the best films I've seen, you know, that Shakes the Clown. Love and, Shakes the yeah, Clown. Yeah, and, and the Bigfoot one and... This guy's fucking great. I saw him one night at Meltdown do uh, this Kiss story. He is killing. Do they still do comedy at Meltdown? No, nah, it's gone. Oh, but it's, this uh, is you know like, like ten years seven ago. years ago or something. Yeah. yeah, Bobcat. There he was, and I saw Bobcat shoot his special at Wolfgang's um, on Columbus. You know, he had the uh, little red Corvette. He he, he had a. A plastic Corvette. It was. It did prints and shit. Huh. I still got the ticket. I showed it to him. Eight fifty, and he goes, "You can't even get a beer for that," <laughs> yeah, which is true. Wow. Yeah. But so you boogie to San Fran. And yeah, and then that's where it all came together for me as a comedian. And you had because I was doing like the Southern circuits and gigs in Florida, 
So it wasn't, you know, um, it, it was some pretty tough gigs with lots of heckling and not the highest uh, yeah. level of intelligence. And then in San Francisco, it's multinational, multi-ethnic, very uh, educated, well-informed people and, you know, radical progressive politics. And um, that's where it all came together for me. I started writing smarter material and that's why I had moved there. And, uh, and, and that's uh, my development as a comedian is primarily because of San Francisco and then later traveling the world. Right. But that's where, um, comedy central discovered me and, and San Fran. Yeah. And I got the, the first, um, development deal in the history of comedy central and wow. Got to be the face of the network for a couple of years. Now, were you into Bill Hicks and guys Bill like Hicks that? Bill Hicks was my god. Right. Yeah, right. and I worked with him in Orlando when I was young. And uh, yeah, here's a good story for you. The you know, in 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 Florida like he played at the 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 Orlando Comedy Club and afterwards the local comedians we took him out to there was this place called Skeeter's um uh, Big Biscuits or some shit. It was yeah. like a food place. Local, Tiger. you know. And like we, this was like the thing to eat, you know, late night. And we took Bill, and you know, retrospect, it was horrible. The gravy was gray and had like <laughs> sausage chunks in it, yeah. and and we were asking him questions, and you know, he couldn't have been nicer to us, right? And I had always heard about this guy. He was a he was a genius, but he was a fuck up and a drunk, and he'd burn his bridges. Couldn't have been nicer, right? So that year I lived in New York, and it sucked. I remember going to Catch a Rising Star. And the bar out front, all these like snooty ass New York comedians, nobody would talk to me. I was just some punk from Florida. And Bill Hicks had started doing Letterman back then. And everybody loved Bill Hicks. Of course. He was everybody's hero. And he'd walk into Catch a Rising Star and he'd see me and he'd walk straight to me. Hey, Tom, how's it going? How's it going? Are you getting stage time? And he was like, and I just remember that feeling of, you know, I'm starving. I got like 85 cents in my pocket. Yeah. But... He made me feel like the most important person in the world and looking at all these guys who wouldn't give me the time of day uh, and feeling their hearts sinking because they didn't know the coolest guy in comedy at that time. That's so needed early on because, you know, my first year at the comedy store, the patio, it was god awful. I remember being on that patio and just being ha getting hazed like a motherfucker, like, look at this old dude. You know, and I'm 44, when yeah. I look back, I didn't look old, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? But these guys are like 22, yeah. 23 on the patio. But I played music all my life, so everybody kind of seems like if you're not, you know, what I call a, a tumbleweed where you're stuck in some era, I constantly was in the, you know, the machine yeah. of, of round people that were into art and stuff, so... But I remember Ari Shafir asking me to be on his podcast, which was a big deal back then, other than Marin's, you know? And then that was a game changer because he was kind of, they're like, well, if Ari thinks he's all right, then yeah. okay. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you need somebody like that. Of course, Bill Hicks is way bigger than th that at the time. But yeah, Ari and then when I lived in San Francisco, I, I would go see him when he would play at the punchline. Yeah. And uh, remember the Alex Bennett show? Of course. That's I did the Alex Bennett show yeah. with, with Bill, and he had brought a cassette promo copy of the album Dangerous. Wow. He, and, and then after the show, nobody took it. Oh, shit. And I pocketed it. Yeah. And I still have it. Yes. And, but I remember he would play to the punchline in San Francisco for like, it wasn't sold out. It'd be half empty. Well, that and it last drove one him he did. nuts. He would be like, I just got back from Ireland, yeah. you know, where I played in a 13th century church for 2,000 people. Yeah. And I can't even sell out a fucking comedy club in San Francisco. Well, it the last one he did, that last special where he's super skinny and he's got like the Hawaiian shirt, that's in San Fran and there's nobody there, you well. know? So that is also another demon, you know, because there's these weird things that happen where there's bands that are big in Europe, yeah. but they can't even fucking do, you know, Spaceland here or whatever club, you know, and you never really understand because there might be somebody that may have your flavor and then they're big in the U.S. Like, you know, with Bill Hicks, it's just kind of like, 
well, wait, this guy's kind of Bill Hicksish, but he's way bigger, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that can fucking ruin you instead of going, well, you know, I might not be big here, but I can go to Europe and, and do two, 3,000 people, you know? I mean, at least somewhere somebody gets you. I think you have to look at the positive because the negative will tear you apart. You know, like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm going to fucking quit. Instead of, you know, you're turning your back on the people that dig you. Kings of Leon, they went to Europe for like five years selling out festivals. And then they hit here, which is crazy, you know? Yeah. They fucking got huge here on like their third record. It's wild. You never know what's going to hit. I wish they'd hit. jump around a little bit more on stage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Kings of Leon. Yeah, man. I do too. Yeah. I've seen him in concert a few times. People deserted yeah. him after that big record, you know? Yeah. Um, that new record is coming out. And fuck, man. It sounds, the song out right now sounds great. Mustang. So, Sam Fran, we got, we had the Purple Onion, we got Cobbs, we got Punchline, and then, um, there was yeah, one on the creek. The, the comedians, they were, yeah, there was a punch on the Walnut Creek. That, um, the, the, the local scene was Mark Marin, Greg Proops, Margaret Cho, Pat right. Oswalt, Blaine Patch, Yeah. Um, Greg Barrett. It was, um, God, it was such a brilliant scene. And I remember just being all young comedians together. Yeah, yeah you know. I mean, comedy, it's funny even when you think about Marin and, and Patton Oswalt and, and, and guys like that. Or, you know, when you see them early on, now, as I started to watch them uh, over the last 10 years, they became fucking a million times better than when they were younger. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Bill, uh, um, Marin's last special, fantastic. And with bands, it's the opposite. All their good shit seems to happen in the first five years, and then they they kind of go south. Yeah. But with comics, if you stick with it, I mean, fucking all of the greats. That's a good point. I never thought about that. Yeah, like Burr, Marin, uh, Patton. These guys, uh, Su uh, Sarah Silverman, as you've watched them over the years, you go, holy shit, these guys are fucking... Actual like surgeons of of comedy, just yeah. you know. Well, I know, you know, I quit smoking weed in January. Yeah, and I haven't drank alcohol in ten years. Excellent. And um, you know, I personally think I'm better than I've ever been. Hundred percent. I wish I would have gave up the weed, uh, you know, ten years earlier. Yeah. But um, but I never thought about that. Yeah, definitely. In comedy, I mean, look at Carlin. I thought he unbelievable. He was he was great as he got older. Yeah, and and you know, Bob Newhart. You know, the older he got, the better those records got. Because I think the longer you live, of course, as long as you are skilled at writing, the longer you live, the better your perspective, your personal voice, as yeah. we're all looking for starting comedy. I watched a clip of me like from the first year in the main room and my voice is like three octaves higher because I'm out there just cooking on adrenaline I'm like, whoa, crazy. <laughs> uh, and yeah. somebody goes, is this speeding up? I go, fuck, I can't even believe I'm talking that high. I can't believe it. You know? right. But yeah, it's, um, it's wild. I mean, you know, even Springsteen, who I think is the all time greatest at songwriting, singer songwriting, um, you know, those first five albums, you know, where people's first three, four specials, if they stay in the game later on, you're just like, these are so much better. It's hard to keep somebody for an hour. Right. A fucking hour in this ADD TikTok swipe fucking, you know, scrolling world. Yeah. Crazy. So Comedy Central, fucking cool. It's huge at the time. It just starts up. And boom, are you out starting to... Because nobody was really doing theaters and arenas. No, but I was then. on the road. <clears throat> yeah, right. You know? Um, and it was killing. And then San Francisco was great. There were so many clubs there. I could do the road less and just play, you know, in the Bay Area. Yeah. Which was great. But um, but yeah, no, I was, I was flying off headline and... At, at clubs and packing and them out. It was great. It was packed. Yeah, fucking great. Yeah, the um, I remember like I did this hour special for Comedy Central called Viva Vietnam. Yeah, because my father flew helicopters in Vietnam, 
and he was shot down. Everyone in the helicopter died except for him and his co-pilot, who he dragged across a field under heavy fire. He got like, you know, five, six medals. So Vietnam was always a big talk topic in the household. Oh, I can't <laughs> and imagine. So in 94, Bill Clinton had just opened up Vietnam for Americans to travel there. And Comedy Central was letting me do anything. And I had this development deal. So I pitched to them, why don't you let me do this travel show? Um, let me go to Vietnam and, and, and get to experience it. Let me get, there, let me get to go there and have fun for the guys who went there and didn't get to have fun. So I had all these great things. Um, I brought Rock'em Sock'em robots and fought people wherever we went. It was yeah. like the rematch. Set up a slip and slide on the uh, China Beach. It was the world's most dangerous place to set up a slip and slide. In Hanoi, the Jane Fonda workout tape was really big at the time. Oh, yeah. So in Hanoi, these old women were doing Tai Chi. And we set up a TV with a VCR and had to run like a cable three blocks uh, with extension cords. to, uh, and, and these old women went crazy for this Jane Fonda workout tape. Crazy. And um, so, it, so, so that was a really cool special that I did. Oh, and I, there was a restaurant where they served any kind of food. Yeah. Uh, uh, every kind of animal. King Cobra. And so we got, we got Cobra. <laughs> Wow. And they brought it out. I just guessed. And they cut the um, cobra's heart out. Yeah. They put shot glasses on the table. They, you know, for the guy throws the cobra on the ground and he smacks it on the nose. Apparently, cobras are more delicious when they're pissed off and the blood is pumping. Wow. So this cobra, like, it, 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 its, its hood opens and it, it struck at the dude. And, like, the sound of it scared the shit out of me. It was just a couple feet away. And this guy grabs the... You know, he leans back and then leans in, grabs the cobra by the heart, and then they kill it at the table, cut the heart out, put the heart in one of the shot glasses, and then they drained the blood in all the shot glasses and put vodka. Fuck. So the guest of honor gets the one with the the beating cobra heart in it. Oh. And I was the guest of honor. Right. And so they said, um, I was like, fuck, I ain't drinking that. Yeah. Like, I'll, do the, I'll do the blood in the vodka, but I'm not doing the heart. And they're like, you're going to offend these people. And oh, I was, shit. I was like, I don't give a fuck if I offend anybody. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, yeah, I'm not eating a so cobra we did, heart. So we don't know the shots. Anthony Bourdain, when he went there. I saw that. He did the heart. I saw And that. then every, all these people wrote about it. And like, it was such a big deal. It was like, fuck, I should have ate the heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> that, should, that should be the name of your next album. I should have ate, ate the heart. I should have ate the heart. I'd be bigger now. <laughs> so that, that special was... Um, it, it, it got a lot of great reviews. It was um, it, it, it kind of um, uh, put me on the map in a lot of ways. So that summer, and it came on April 1995 for the 20th anniversary of the end of the war. So that summer, I was playing in Minneapolis, and Prince's keyboard player Tommy came to my show. Yeah, and he he'd seen Viva Vietnam, loved it, and you know um, the said, doctor said he was a fan of my comedy, and he said that. Uh, in the summer, Prince does these jam sessions that start at three in the morning and don't go until like six or seven. And he invited me and the other comedians. And we went to Paisley Park and it was one of the greatest nights of my life. I'm a huge Prince fan. Oh yeah, same here. There was like 50 people there and he was just walking around. I, I met him. Uh, he's tiny and he, uh, he had that white instrument looking guitar and he just wailed like Hendrix and his girlfriend Mai Tai it was her birthday she just danced around and um and there, there was one comedian local guy who didn't go that night <laughs> and he said uh oh I'll go another time and uh when Prince died that was the first guy who who contacted me I can't believe I didn't go that night let me ask you this is the interesting part I think about comedy that are people that are still in the game, you and Marin and other people, uh, Patton and uh, Dave Attell, you guys were rolling through the 90s when comedy was dead. Yeah. It fucking died because when I started at the store, it was a goddamn ghost town. And that, that, that Well, I'll tell you, it was, it was, I'm glad you bring that up because it was really perfect timing for me. Yeah. Because I was a feature act when... The comedy boom bust. Right. And all these clubs were closing. And so I was just, you know, I was a strong middle act. So 
there was all these headliners from L.A. that wouldn't go on. They were used to making like four to six thousand bucks a week, right? And they wouldn't go on the road for the for fifteen hundred or right. two thousand. But then to go from a middle act who was making seven eight hundred dollars a, a week. To making fifteen or two thousand a week, right? It was a perfect transition time for me. Um, unfortunately, the headliner money hasn't raised that much <laughs> in thirty <laughs> years. But. Yeah, you know, I saw a great fucking thing on Instagram. <clears throat> it was a, a meme, and it was a, a it was a musician with a guitar, and it said, "I just went to twenty ninety, the year twenty ninety." And it turns out musicians still make one fifty a night. <laughs> Fucking wow. nuts, man. Yeah. Nuts. You know, it's it's wild when you first start headlining because I had to headline early on when I know I wasn't ready. Yeah. But it was the only way you were going to make money. A lot of well, crowd work. Yeah, it wasn't that. I would just fucking go slow. Yeah. And I would uh, stretch. And I would do bits that weren't that strong in the middle because yeah. I know they might be ordering drinks or whatever and then close strong. Yeah, the tent poles. You, you, you let, yeah. let, let it sag in the middle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's fucking, you know, I trip out on people that don't go on the road and, and learn these skills because now they all want it fast of like, oh, I did a, a crowd work bit and it blew up on tiktok yeah and you see all these young comics and they're all doing they're filming all their sets yeah and they're just doing uh, nothing but crowd work yeah and it's like and that thank god that's already kind of passed away the it, algorithm doesn't even show me that stuff anymore right even tiktok was like people are gonna burn out on this change the algorithm Great. you know but if you blew up on tiktok and all of a sudden you're on the road headlining as a new comedian on the road, is so fucking hard. I don't think I could tell people how hard it is. I could tell you all day long, and you know it's brutal. You know, you're fucking 20 minutes in. It might not be going good. You're like uh, a late show Friday, and the audience Friday, is drunk. Drunk. And then the bills come out. No, check drops. Yeah. And the fucking, you know... The middle guys doing the hacky town stuff that they all know, you know, the town references. I mean, you know, you were down at Squirrels Bar last week, Carol, and they're like, ah, yeah. squirrels, you know, and that was an amazing scene on the Louis show where the character of Jim Florentine is uh, featuring and then. Louie's not doing well, so they switch. <laughs> yeah. The boss comes up and he well, goes, hey, uh, we're going to have to move you to feature. And Louie's like, uh, am I going to get paid the same? He's like, yeah. And he goes, I don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? Because by then he's just tapped out. Right. But it's fucking gnarly, right? I mean, back then in the 90s, were you going to like middle America just to some club, like the fucking funny stop or whatever? No, I've always had my, um, you know, the, the, the core... Clubs that I still do, right? The Atlanta Punchline, right? Acme in Minneapolis, yeah. San Francisco Punchline, right? You know, SAC Punchline, SAC, Portland at all? Uh, yeah, I haven't done Helium in like ten years. Yeah. I used to. I love Portland. I wish so I could I. play there more often. Yeah. So you're forty years in, and I wanted to ask you this because people always ask me why I quit music. You know, why'd you quit music? You right. know. And I always ask people, have you ever done anything for five years? Have you ever done anything for 10 years? Have you worked at the same place for 20 years, 25? And none of them have, you know? So until they do something that long, they'll never understand. It's like, well, I've done it. So when you're 40 years in, do you still dig it? Yeah. The only time it's been difficult um, is when I've had my heart broken, like... My father was killed by a drunk driver in 2009. Damn. My little sister died of breast cancer in 2011. 2012, 2013, I'd stopped drinking for pleasure. Uh, you know, and then I wasn't writing much material. Right. You know, fortunately, I had a lot of material to fall back on, but um, I was just heartbroken. Right. And then I was so drunk in Philadelphia one night, I blacked out and busted my head open. 
and then I haven't drank since then. During the pandemic, I witnessed a suicide. Oh, my. You witnessed one? Yeah, some woman jumped off the Grove parking garage as I was walking by, and she landed my arm's length to my right. Wow. And the sound of this woman hitting the pavement, and she bounced next to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I wasn't to a comedy. The, the, everything was closed down during the pandemic. Yep. But, man, that was a real brain fuck uh, to pull myself out of. Uh, I had to let the 12-year-old boy in me take over. Bought some roller skates. Yeah, I saw that. You used started. to be out there in Venice rollerblading. Yeah, man. Uh, roller skates, not rollerblades. Right. And I got into hot yoga and just doing all this, like, um, you know, just trying to find joy in life again. And then, thank God, comedy started again. Yeah. Um, 2021. So, really embraced it. Because yeah. it, it, you know, there, it, it just, it, you know, something happens when you step on the stage. The only time it's been difficult for me is when I've times I've had my heart broken, like over a woman or deaths of a loved one. Yeah. You know, things like that. But other than that, I uh, I can't wait to step on stage and grip the mic and throw my comedy thunderbolts. You were married when I met you, and now you're not married to uh, that woman. And you guys do a podcast together? Well, she's still my best friend. Right. You know, we um, we weren't getting along that great the last couple of years we were together. And I was, I was, I was doing, I've been doing the, uh, the international comedy circuits for years. So I was just taking gigs all over the world. I was gone. And then it was her idea to break up. And she said, I think we'd be happier with other people. And we didn't have any kids. We didn't own a house. We just evenly divided the money that we, um, that we had in the bank. And uh, she's my best friend in the world. That's great. She's the, I trust her more than anyone. Yeah. You know, she could have, she didn't, we didn't have an ugly divorce. She could have, you know, um, got a lawyer and made things ugly, but she didn't. And um, she's one of the best people I've ever known. And she helps me with different writing projects. Uh, for my podcast, we, um, it's called Tom Road Smart Camp. So, right. you know, I, I've had you on there. I'll interview comedians or other uh, interesting people. But... Once a month, um, because uh, I'm a big reader. You've been to my apartment. He's yeah. got thousands of books. Yeah. So uh, I'm doing like one episode a month where it's like a book report uh, on whatever book I just finished. And one episode a month, I'm doing a conversation with her, my um, um, smart bestie. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Where'd she, where, she still live in LA? And then, and then there's one on, yeah, one's on books and movies, one best friend, one interview, and then, oh, and then once a month, I'll do one where it's just me rambling, a smart ramble. Yeah. You yeah. Know, whatever's on my mind. When you came to LA and then you, you, you've been here three times, each time you move out of here, where did you go? New York, Florida, where, where, where'd you go? Well, uh, the first time I lived in LA was, um, you know, I came here from San Francisco because I was offered the sitcom. Right. On NBC, and I lived on top of the Hollywood Hills. I lived with a beautiful actress, and all we did was walk around naked drinking wine from goblets. Oh, shit. But 80s they, style, or was that 90s? No, 96 to 97. Wow. What was it called? Mr. Rhodes. Mr. Rhodes. I played a school right. teacher. Yeah, I remember that. And the show, you know, they wouldn't give me jokes, and it was, um, it, it, the, the, the show itself was, uh, was disappointing, but... I had I made a truckload of cash. That's old sitcom money. Yeah. Right? And uh, I always swore if I ever had any money, I'd live in New York City with style. So I moved back to New York City, got a rock star apartment in the Wall Street area, and just focused on stand-up. Yeah. Seller. And doing the seller. And uh, Mitch Hedberg was like, I'd, I'd say... I lived there from 98 to 2000. He and I were like best friends. Wow. He's living at the, uh, the Chelsea... Oh, love and it. I was living in Wall Street, and you know, a, a tell would take us around a late night, you know, watering holes, and and you guys doing mm. drugs? Yeah, me and Hedberg did. Yeah, yeah. and he, yeah. it was fun when it was just coke and yeah, right, ecstasy. Once That's he dope. got it, That's once dope. he got into heroin, he he really became a different person. Yeah, and then he he didn't want to hang out anymore. You know, yeah, he yeah. just kind of wanted to go back uh, and be by himself and do, you know. Did Whatever. you ever see that guy's writing process? Was he writing? Yeah, the best thing about hanging out with Hedberg, like he and I would sit down with our notebooks sometimes and just like throw new shit at each other. Yeah. You know? And it always killed me because like cocaine, I could never write material on. <laughs> but he, you know, like he could still write. Like we'd go on a bender for a couple of nights and then 
you know, he's got like a new, uh, you know, bit about, you know, cinnamon incense or something. And I'm like, how do when we were fucking doing coke yeah. by the, uh, you know, uh, uh, Holland Tunnel with those fucking people, when did you have time to write that? Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was one of my best memories when he, he and I would, um, you know, break out the notebooks and read shit to each other, you know? Um, but I also, at that time, started taking trips to London. I looked at the money I had as my NBC artist grant. Yes. And my friend Rich Hall lived over in London. He thought I would do really well there. So he kind of coached me on getting in with London. You don't go to the best clubs first. Do some peripheral rooms around the city. Get your, your, your sea legs. And then you go to the, the, the London Comedy Store and these other ones. And then once I got in with the London Comedy Store, I started doing London you know, a couple times a year and then other gigs around England. And then that led to other gigs around Europe. And, uh, and then I, I, I met a woman in Amsterdam and ended up moving to Amsterdam in 2000. Yeah, you were doing a late night, like a Letterman show there? Yeah, I had my own late night talk show on Dutch television. That's fucking wild. Yeah, it was amazing. The, you know, I was on the road all the time, and I was really partying yeah. hard back then. Amsterdam. I mean, like, you know, because I was partying so hard with Hedberg. And Attel in New York City, and the, the thing I always, I always tell people, I was partying so hard when I lived in New York City, I actually moved to Amsterdam to bring it down a notch, <laughs> you know, which is actually true. Yeah. Because I met this, you know, kind of sweet uh, Dutch woman, and um, I was living with her in Amsterdam, and, uh, but I was still doing gigs all over Europe, and I was gone a lot. Yeah. And she wanted to settle down and have a family, so she broke up with me. Yeah, there you go, dude. And we I was just, just about, about to move back to the United States when these people from this Dutch television network saw me performing at Tumler, the oldest, best club in Amsterdam, and they were looking for an American to host a late night talk show. Wow. And I got the job. Why did they want an American host? Because they had tried to do the American late night format with Dutch people. Yeah. And it never worked. So they, they thought, well, let's, let's try and do it with an American. And the concept of the show was I was a, a foreigner experiencing Dutch culture. So every episode, I would make a five-minute film where I would experience something of Dutch culture, like spend a day with a Dutch farmer <clears throat> uh, yeah. doing farmer things. I walked into an electric fence. He said, look out for the electric fence, but I don't speak Dutch. And yes. I got electrocuted. Hilarious. Once a week, is it on? Or was it Yeah, on? it was on once a week. We would do, it was one week on, one week off. We would film two episodes um, at once. Yeah. And then there was this word of the day. They would teach me Dutch. Um, a girl in a bikini would come out with a Dutch word, and the audience would teach me how to say it and tell me what it meant. Five years, that's... No, 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 the, the show was two years. Oh, I got you. Uh, we did three seasons, but it was a two-year period. Uh -huh. But, you know, I grew up watching Carson and Letterman, so to be the guy coming out from behind the curtain with, like, the $3,000 suit on, stand on the X, do a five-minute monologue, yeah, and then sit down and banter with my musical host, skit, first guest, skit, second guest, skit, band. It was the, 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 the exact format of a late night show. So I got to live my, my Carson dream. That's cool. And be that guy. Was it good money? It was decent. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it was, it, you know, it was, it was good enough money. It wasn't like American television money, but. Still, though. But it was good. Yeah. It was good enough to live in the center of Amsterdam and, um, you know, have an extravagant, fun lifestyle. That's cool, man. And then when that ended, the same network. Um, the, the, the woman who ran the network, or the production company, she was from Argentina. And I know it really uh, helped out that my mother was from Argentina when, right. I, when I got the job. Uh, and I'll, I'll never forget, she called me into the office to tell me they were going to discontinue, the network had decided to discontinue the show. She said, that's the bad news. The good news is, uh, there was this really popular travel show on Dutch television called You're In Travel. She's in, there were four hosts, uh, presenters. She said, we're unhappy with one of the presenters and we're giving you the job. That's wow. the good news. That's great. So I got to be a, a, a presenter on a travel show for a year. Wow. And I did a highlight on St. Petersburg, Russia, Peru, the Champagne region of France, the Dutch Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, just absolute dream life that I had in Amsterdam.
It's funny. I've traveled the world, you know, and you have too. And now I always tell people, you know, I have this bit where I'm like, uh, if you meet someone you love, you know, you think it's the one you want to spend the rest of your life with, don't fuck every day, you know? Oh, gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. You told me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've fucks. seen you do that. It's a great yeah. bit. <clears throat> well, same thing goes with um, travel because here I am 58 and I'm like, I've been everywhere. I still need to go to Australia because it, both times I was going, it was SARS and the next time. Oh, was, I love Australia. But I, I think you're right because I've been to the Great Wall of China three times. Yeah. And the third time I was there, I was like, well, why the fuck did I come back here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, right. Yeah. Now, it, to me, it's like I'm cool with sitting right where we're at right now. Yeah. And when I'm not traveling as a comedian i don't want to travel at all i like being home or in todo santos like the bottom of the baja of you know backside of cabo you know like a real sleepy sitting on a beach i'm not a beach guy but just that sounds of the waves eating mm. fish tacos doing nothing really man. i the, i i never i've never been to that part of mexico it's great and, um, it's like malibu but without the rich people Okay. It's unbelievable. But cuz I had a when I was in Mexico 5 years ago, I got uh the cops tried to shake me down. Oh yeah. And then 3 months ago I went back to Tulum and I was in um Acumal. Yeah. The downtown. I went to some little taco shop and some uh cartel guy was drunk and ugly. And I was like one of the only me and my buddy were the only white dudes in there. Yeah. And um Comes in, he says something loudly and sharply to me. And I knew he wasn't asking for the time. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm looking the guy in the eyes. And, you know, thank God I'm sober. And I'm, uh, I'm just trying to let the guy know that there's no threat here. And he, uh, w when he paused three times, I just put my hand on my heart and went, Respecto. Yeah. Respecto. Yeah respecto and then the dude moved on and the guy sitting with us at our table um said yeah some bad people have moved into the village and it's best not to have any trouble with them yeah. <laughs> and um you know by bad people you know he meant cartel people yeah so and my mom was like don't go there there's cartel people and i was like mom that's bullshit yeah yeah and then, yeah like I remember riding the Sturgis. So, so two close calls like that. I think um, yeah. I might be dumb with Mexico. Well, you got to go to the, the other side. This is like, it's basically California. You know, it's after San Diego. You just keep going and you're just, you know, it's a lot of expats and it's cool. Yeah, it's that's what way I different. thought about. Uh, but I mean, you know, fuck, <laughs> I was riding the Sturgis uh, one year. I've been five, six times or whatever. Me and my buddy stopped at a, a roadside bar. It looked just like that movie Roadhouse. Right. Get a get a you know uh, some waters and gas and we went inside and ordered. It was like a weird you know bar, and we got the drinks and these two dudes came over, and they were like, "After you finish those, you'll leave," and we were like, "Yep," like straight <laughs> up like fucking easy rider. We don't need to finish these. Yeah, really? yeah, yeah. Well, I don't even think we did. Wow. <laughs> we just gassed up and left. But you know. I don't really think it matters where you're at. I, I think they've... So they, they didn't want uh, commerce and money coming into their... Well, I think spec. it was like a off-the-road play. We, I would take real back roads to Sturgis, yeah. not the fucking standard highways. Yeah. Because I like to see, like, fucking America out there on the motorcycle. Right. So this is kind of like, you know, hey, you guys don't belong here. You know, it was pretty wild, but... Wherever you go, I used to have this magnet, I would say, like the fucking freak magnet. I could be in a bar of like 400, 500 people, and then I'd look over to the right, and there'd be just a guy there staring at you like, what do you look like? Oh, no. Right. I got the fucking, that <laughs> magnet, you know? It was, it's, it's a weird world out there, man, especially right now. Oh. This is another thing, bummer about traveling, and you know this, is just the airports are just a shit show now. Yeah. It's brutal. Brutal. Yeah. Nobody knows how to travel. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. People you know? have no class, no manners. No. No, not at all. Well, what do you got? You got road dates all, all the time, right? Yeah, I'm doing a lot this summer. Um, 
I'm going to be in Atlanta, I think May 17th through 19, and then a couple of gigs in Florida, and then um, I'm in San Francisco at Cheaper Than Therapy in June. What's that? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool little club on Sutter Street. Oh, cool. And uh, Acme in Minneapolis in June. Oh, yeah, I'm there in July. Nice. Killer. Love it. Love that place. And Minneapolis in summer is so fantastic. And, and then July, I'm doing, um, uh, um, I'm going to go to New York City to do uh, the Comedy Cellar first week of June or July. And then uh, I'm doing Hyenas in Fort Worth and Dallas after that. You do the Vegas Cellar at all? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's a great room. Yeah, I'm going there next month. I love it there. I go there. And yeah, work. I'll be there the, the July whatever 29 to August 2nd. I'm at the cellar in Vegas. Great, great room to work on shit, man. Yeah. You know? What do you do in Vegas during the day? Um, I don't drink and I don't gamble. Neither do I. So, um... I do a lot of sleeping. Uh, you know... Yeah, I'm always working on stuff when I'm there, you know? Yeah. And I like all the... I used to hate Vegas, but there's a lot of great restaurants, a lot of great there food is. there. Oh, God. And not far from the Rio is the Chinatown. Um, what's that? Spring Mountain Road. Right. And there's um, Shanghai Plaza. Uh-huh. And there's a place called uh, Taste of Shanghai. And they do... Uh, I love Shanghai. I mean, I, I wouldn't go back to China now, but fortunately, I got to play there like six, seven times expats uh, a lot of expats and then people you know a lot of when you're in china it was chinese english speakers who either grew up in english speaking countries or were educated that's cool in english speaking countries but um shanghai is kind of famous for their soup dumplings and there's this place called shanghai taste that does some really nice soup dumplings in vegas yeah wow yeah so there's like little little hidden gems like that you know i used to hit record stores yeah um, Sammy Hagar just opened up a full pool thing at the Palms. It opens like in a couple weeks. Like a swimming pool, like you got to pay. Well, I don't think you have to pay uh, on the weekdays, but it's like, you know, like a full setup of like, you know, Hagar type flavor, Cabo Wabo or whatever. I was just reading about it, like a big, a big fucking takeover on the pool scene there. Nice. Yeah, they're going to have bands and stuff. Oh, cool. You know. I was talking to somebody lately, and it's like I went to a, uh, a grand opening of a, a clothing place, and they go, yeah, it's going to be great. We're going to have bands. And I was like, oh, oh bummer, because <laughs> I, I don't want to have to try to talk over a band. Yeah. You know, you're just, what? And the band's over there playing covers, <laughs> you know? Yeah. God damn. I'm old. <laughs> I've gotten old. I just want to do comedy and lay down. Hilarious. Right? <laughs> All right, man. Uh, give him the name of your podcast one more time. Tom Rhodes Smart Camp. Yeah. I'm um, at underscore Tom Rhodes on, on Instagram. And I was just on his podcast. You can go uh, hear that. And then go see him live, man. Thanks for doing the show, dude. Yeah, thank you, brother. Oh, fuck yeah. yeah. We, we got to go hiking. I would love it. I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll do it with you another day. Yeah, but, anytime. But I would love to do it with you. What yeah. a beautiful view. I, that's cool that while we're having this conversation, hummingbirds have been yeah. popping around. Yeah, I like I fucking recording the podcast. And I got nothing but love and respect for you, Dean. We didn't even get to talk about clothes. I love your style. Oh, man, we, we don't have to go. <laughs> I love, uh, we, we both um, have our own unique styles and, yeah. uh, you know. That was an interesting thing about Bill Hicks because he dressed in all black and then when he got the cancer, he felt that that brought the cancer in, like his black persona and his dark image and everything. And, and then he changed to the Hawaiian shirts and stuff. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, the, yeah, that's what I read. I mean, I, you know, I talked to his mom. I did uh, a couple years in a row. I did the Bill Hicks um, shows. I did the premiere at Sunset Five and did comedy at the store and... His mom and his brother, and um, super cool, man. His mom's so great. Yeah, I've know? met his, his mom yeah. and his brother a few times. Great people. But you tend to wear all black, right? No, no, no. I've actually, uh, a couple years ago, I used to wear all black. Right, right. And a couple years ago, I purposefully uh, went um, dark blue, marine blue, yeah. instead of black. Yeah. So good blue's my favorite color, any variation. And uh, yeah, no, I'm wearing blue instead of black now. I recently switched um, jean cuts. 
I was wearing Super Slim forever. Yeah. And now... Yeah, and Slim's not so cool now. It's, um... Well... Uh, baggy is, is back. I'm not into baggy, but I want to be able to wear boots, um... And the pant fit over them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm the same way. And, it's, and Brian, the boot maker. Yeah. Uh, my engineer boots, my 1940s engineer boots. He made the tops for me. Slimmer. S- yeah, slimmer, so I could put them under uh, under the jeans. And did he make them lower? No, I don't think so. I think normal. Yeah, because uh, I had an idea to make like cinch, six inch high engineer boots. So you get the engineer look, but the barrel doesn't go all the way up your calf. Okay. You know, I'm always tweaking on stuff like that. I like it. I like to, um, I like to tailor clothes and, you know, I, I love going to vintage and thrift stores. Yeah. I like finding old stuff. I'm really into uh, vintage Carhartt jeans oh, now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the, the, I mean, I'm really into Pendleton's vintage stuff. Great. Uh, old Wrangler jackets, uh, jean jackets, things like that. Well, you know, Sam Fran had that full fashion, man, without being fashion, but the derby jacket, remember it? Yeah. With that fucking paisley gold liner. Ben Davis, huge in San Francisco. The Ben Davis work shirts and and work pants. Yeah. And uh, everybody wore an engineer boot there. Then Doc Martens really fucking hit hard in San Fran on Hate Street. Yeah. I mean, Doc Martens were fucking huge in SF. Yeah, and still are. Like in Portland and San Francisco, now everybody's wearing the Doc. Yeah, I like Doc Martens a lot. Um, The Carhartt brand, you know, like in America, you can usually just get it where they sell tractor supplies or work people shit. But Carhartt is like super hot in Europe now. Like vintage shit. And then also, there's this, this company, they franchise the Carhartt brand... And there's this, it's called Carhartt Whip. And the, in, uh, every big city in Europe has got a Carhartt Whip store. There's only two in America. One's in New York City. And there's one in Los Angeles on La Brea. Right. So oh, I, got I saw some, it. I got some great, um, you know, Carhartt jackets and like. Yeah, it's d- more styling Carhartt. It's, it's streetwear. Right. Um, yeah. Carhartt shit. Yeah. Yeah. I actually And then saw also when I, when I was in Europe, um, I did a, a nice tour in Holland, Belgium, and France in November, December, and uh, got a lot of great G Star Raw, yeah, uh, jeans and jackets and shit. So that, so that's what I'm rocking now: the Pendleton, the Carhartt, G Star Raw. I can't wear Wrangler the Pendleton jackets because the wool it just bug bugs me. Hmm. So I go the. Ironheart flannels because they're cotton. Oh, yeah, I've seen you wear those shirts. Yeah, yeah. they're nice and soft because wool drives me crazy. You said this come from Japan? Yeah, Japan. Nice. They're really fucking soft on my neck. Like whenever I see you at the comedy store or some other club, I'm always like, eyeballing what you got on. <laughs> like, I always see, I always like watching what material you're doing on stage. But I'm like, where'd you, okay, where, where, where'd you get those boots? Where'd you get that jacket? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, I don't know. I just like to look good, you know? Uh, it's uh, like we talked about it on your podcast. It's just uh, just coming up in rock and roll, man. I just fucking love fashion. I love it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, and- me too. I've always been into, into clothes and looking good. And we talked about this on my podcast. I, I, pod, I heard uh, Earthquake yeah. say, um, you know, the, no one in your audience should be dressed better than you. I believe that too. And I always like. Which I mean, I don't mind if somebody's like, but you know, you you well, should yeah. be one of the coolest dressed right. people there. I always laugh at people. You know, I sometimes like uh, I've been posting up photos of me in the jackets. You know, lately jackets that I love. Oh yeah, I like that little series that you're doing. Yeah. Nobody's giving you shit for that. Well, I'm sure you know people are like. But yeah. I like it because I I think you got a lot of great jackets. Yeah, and I love them, and you know. I put one on and I go, this is one of those jackets where they're like, fuck that guy in his jacket. <laughs> you know, his fucking dumb I jacket. I like that thing you used to do, was it like five years ago or something? It was like cars of Los oh, Angeles. Oh, dope cars in the dope. neighborhood. That was it, man. Yeah. I thought that, I really loved that series that you were doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, I started firing that up again, man. I took a picture of a car today. <laughs> Look at this one. I just sent it over to Bill. It is so crazy, this car. I think it was a fucking... Uh, Dodge or a Studebaker, but look at this. It's just parked on uh, the street. Look at that thing. Wow, look at the fins on that. Yeah, it's like a fucking 50s 
we want to be a Cadillac, but we're not. And it's in <laughs> one of my favorite colors, salmon. Salmon. You know, I love salmon when it comes to a watch. A salmon dial. That'll yeah. make me fucking crazy. I don't know. I just love good shit. I started watching James Bond when I was a kid. And I just learned about high-end fashion stuff. You know, he's out there in Rosignol skis. I'm like, what are those? He's wearing a fucking <laughs> Rolex Submariner. Yeah. He's driving an Aston Martin. I'm like, what, are, what is this stuff? He's in the Swiss Alps. Where's that? And then as you get older and you go, you're like, this is where they film Bond. Oh, I fucking love that. What You know? Yeah. Well, I remember growing up watching television as a kid. It always seemed to me the best dressed people were stand-up comedians and pimps. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's 70s American television. I remember one time I met that Don Bishop Juan, uh, like a former pimp or whatever. and uh, I met him at uh, Voodoo Fest in New Orleans, a yeah. tool show. He's just fully dressed like a pimp. Green. I got a photo. Green hat, green suit, feather coming off it. This is like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know. He's walking around the airport like that. <laughs> wow. Did you read those uh, Iceberg, Iceberg Slim? Slim? Yeah, yeah, the first two. Right. And I even got a vinyl record of him doing this kind of spoken word thing. Really? Yeah, it's pretty boring. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> you know, it's not good, but I have it. If anybody wants it. You seen Rollins do his spoken word? Yeah, years ago. It's incredible. Years ago. I think it's one of the best things I've ever seen. I really? saw that UC Berkeley. Guy talked three hours. I didn't even notice. It just zoomed mm. by. I love um, John Cooper Clark. Don't and know. I'm friends with him. He's this English punk rock poet. Yeah. He's in his 70s now. Right. And um, the his poem, I Want to Be Yours, The Arctic Monkeys made into a song oh yeah and then the climactic scene of season five of the sopranos uh they used a recording of his called chicken town oh fuck he's he's a, a, i met the guy at the edinburgh festival yeah 25 years ago i've been friends with him and he's like this you know, literary cult figure in england really you, cool dude you think that thing's done i mean it goes on but edinburgh all these festivals. It's a like, long month. I yeah. did it in 2014, and I had a no loss guarantee because you always hear about yeah. comedians going there and then leaving, you know, 10, 20 grand in, in the hole. Right. Uh, I had a no loss guarantee, and um, I still um, had to spend um, 5000 on top of that. Damn. Yeah. To That's, get proper housing and, right, right. you know, feed yourself for a. That's a, a long run, right? It's a long run, and... Um, You're out on the street hustling people into your show? Yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, I, I, I did that minimally. Yeah. Because my venue had a team of young college kids that were out doing that for you. That's great. Which was great. Um, but, uh, yeah, man, it's... And then I had a great room. I was in the, the wine bar at the Gilded Balloon at, like, 9.15. I had a great room, great time. But um, still, I mean, Edinburgh is a great city. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it, it's, it's cool to watch, you know, uh, my, uh, my ex-wife was with me at the time, and we would go see as many shows as we could. Oh, wow. So, like, you see somebody putting on the performance of their lifetime in a broom closet at 2 p.m. Wow. somewhere to, like, four people, you know? Shh. So, I mean, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I did it in 2014, and... Um, I think well, one and done. <laughs> yeah, right. I think that's you know, a unless you're a car. bigger name and you can come in and yeah. you know, do some of the theater shows and stay for a week. Yeah, that's the way to do that's it. That's the way to do it. All right, man. I love you, Dean. I love you too, dude. And uh Thanks for having me on, man. I, I love your podcast. <laughs> yeah. I love uh you know, your knowledge of music and um you as a human being, so it's a real honor to. Uh, that was great to have to you. To have man. be on your show, thank you. Forty year it. man yes. in comedy. I mean, that's fucking that's a real deal right there. You <laughs> know, that's longer than uh, I would say ninety nine percent of the comedians out there. Yeah, nice. Yeah, right. Nice. Yeah, it's funny to think that comedy isn't that uh, old. No, you and know? you've been doing forty years yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking winner. Yeah. You so know? like. It, it, like when the blues musicians, like, you know, John Louis Hooker and these people, they had the resurgence. I remember in the 90s, 
Yeah. And they were, they're finally making money after being broke and struggling their whole career. That'd be nice if that happened in comedy. You know, where people... Well, there's some people out there making money right now, man. Holy shit. A lot of people are making money. There's more arena acts now than I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, growing up, you saw it. Eddie Murphy did arenas. Dice did some arenas. Steve Martin did some arenas. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. We could name them, you know? And now... Tons of people. It's like, whoa, this guy's doing arenas? You know? It's just fucking cool. Uh, You know? Um, I'm happy for him. And it'll happen. Hooray for comedy. Yeah, hooray for comedy. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys. Don't forget to leave a review uh, on the podcast, YouTube. It totally helps. And don't forget to subscribe to the uh, podcast also on iTunes or wherever you listen to it. Thank you for tuning in. Tom Rhodes was a fantastic guest today, and uh, I want you guys to go check him out uh, on the road and listen to his podcast and subscribe to his podcast and follow him on Instagram. See ya.